Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of Specimens. I hope wherever you're hearing this, you are safe and you are well. I'm super excited, as always, because this episode puts us into double figures. This is episode 10. 10! That means that if you're still listening, you've stuck along for the ride for 10 amazing guests and I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you so much if you're still here. It really means the world and I'm so excited to be the one to bring this to you. I feel completely privileged. So if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm very excited about today's guest. It's somebody who I highly admire. Uh, She's very revered in our industry and she's doing amazing things to make our industry more inclusive and accessible. I really hope you enjoy this call. Thank you again. And all that's left to say is welcome back to another episode of Specimens, episode 10. New York-based Divya is an award-winning taxidermist and educator. Divya's experience ranges from being a museum taxidermist co-author of a beginner's taxidermy book, and internationally recognised artist to celebrity clients. She's also a board member for the New England Association of Taxidermists and the Garden State Taxidermy Association. Divya is also able to maintain commitments to conservation and social causes through her ongoing activism. She regularly hosts fundraisers, raffles, ticketed virtual events, and is a strong voice for equality, diversity, and women in STEM. Divya, I am honoured to host you on my podcast. Thank you so much for giving up your time to speak with me today. Oh, thank you so much, Elle. It's so nice to speak with you. (laughs) My pleasure. It's wonderful to finally have you. How are you and where are you? Um, I'm doing fine. And especially, you know, (laughs) considering the state of the world right now, I'm doing fine. And I'm in New York City. Are you at home? Yep, I'm at home, yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, Well, I'm glad that, you know, you're safe and you're well and you're here with me today. And I'm hoping that this will give you a little bit of escapism. (laughs) Yeah, I'm so excited to chat. (laughs) Well, I'll I'll get started straight away. Personally, I've been following you for a while. You're a friend of mine. And you know that I am fully enamored by the work that you create. And I'm honored to have you because you're so revered in the industry. So I'm very excited to get talking to you about your practice. Um, But the question that I always ask all of my guests is to take me right back to the beginning. Can you give me a little bit of background on what you were like growing up? Do you remember the natural world being important to you back then? Yeah. Well, first, thank you so much. I love your work too, Elle. (laughs) So so it's so great to be chatting. So yeah, going back to like, I guess, gosh, going, going back to the beginning. So... Growing up, you know, I've always grown up in a city. I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, which is, you know, everyone thinks of Jamaica as it's, it's all lush, but, you know, Kingston's a city um, and Miami is a, you know, Miami's a city too. And I grew up mostly in, in Miami. And, um, you know, but there was always like, you know, there were always green spaces. Like my family always had, you know, gatherings in green spaces and stuff. But a lot of like, I think the thing that defined me the most was just curiosity. So, you know, growing up, I was like really rebellious, but I always did really well in school. And that just drove my parents wild because like, I would just always find creative ways of like getting around their strict rules and, you know, being like the first, the first of an immigrant family to be here. Like, you know, they just wanted me to be this really good student, be a doctor or a lawyer or something, you know, something like that. But that was just not happening. So like, they like, you know, for example, they wouldn't allow me to wear certain clothes or, or whatever, but I just learned how to sew them. <laughs> they didn't want me to watch like certain TV shows or like, oh, you can't watch The Simpsons. But I would just go to the library and get like really salacious books. And, <laughs> you know, I probably shouldn't have read things like my Peter said, like when I was young. But I think that kind of stuff just sort of like, you know, that kind of just sort of like, I guess, made me who I am for better or worse. And it also kind of introduced me to like a lot of the like arts and alternative scene, which has been a huge source of support and inspiration to me. And nature kind of plays into this because, you know, living in a city, it felt like nature was a treasure and it also piqued that curiosity. And, you know, where I was always asking in other, you know, in other parts of my life, I was always asking why. And when I looked at things in nature, I would always ask why too. Um, and my mom was a science teacher. So, you know, she would, you know, she had educational specimens that I was just totally fascinated by, not necessarily for their, you know, not necessarily for the same reason she was, I was more interested in how they were made, in addition to, to how beautiful they were. And I guess also, you know, natural history museums were sort of the first 
memorable ways I'd experienced animals because you don't, you know, where you might not see a ton of animals in a city, you know, the museums got me close to animals in a way that, you know, in certain ways I could never even dream of. Yeah, and it was really beautiful the way you said that nature is a treasure. I love that little phrase. <laughs> you, I want to call you up on something. Um, you said that you were born in Jamaica and then you moved over to Miami yeah. and you moved around. Um, and then you went on to say that your parents were fairly conservative with the things that they, they wanted for you. Was this a cultural influence? Was it, was it to do with your heritage that they had these conservative views? I For sure, I think so. I think it's also just like, I mean, the way my parents grew up is... It's just like, I think about it sometimes, like when I see something really stupid happen on the news, I'm just like, wow, my parents grew up with like no electricity or like, you know, they had lived in like very rural part, you know, they lived in very rural parts of the world, no electricity or very little electricity. And here I am now, like, you know, (laughs) within this in a place where I can like order something on the internet and it shows up immediately. So I think like they're... I think their views were just informed by what they knew. They just didn't know that, you know, they just didn't know what else was possible. And I think to them, their version of success kind of looked like, you know, getting, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a doctor or lawyer or engineer. Like, I love my doctor and my lawyer and anyone who's engineered anything. Like, I love those people. But it's just not, you know, it's just not for me. But I think, yeah, I think my parents' idea of success was just informed by what, what they grew up around and what their own dreams and possibilities were seen as. And so, of course, they're going to, you know, they're, of course, going to project that on their kid. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. You said that you were quite rebellious and you moved through these different phases of doing things that were interesting to you. But when did you find that you had the pull towards the arts or the science? What was it that you were good at at school? You know, what did you study? Um, so in school, like I was always, you know, in school, I always loved my art class and I loved my science class. And those were, those were always the two teachers that I enjoyed. The most. Like those were always the two teachers I would become, that I'd become friends with. And I've been so lucky in a way because my art teachers and my science teachers were also just like, they were just like really cool. Like my chemistry teacher in high school collected road, <laughs> he collected road pill and, you know, he taught me how to clean skulls. And, you know, he was just like, he would also like smoke pot in the, you know, he would also like smoke pot in like the parking lot. So that, I mean, that helped too, I guess. But, you know, it was kind of like, you know, I guess having like seeing interesting people like that kind of, it also kind of planted a seed in my head that, oh, like there is more, there's so much more to, to life and a career and pursuing something than that. But I think I've always just, you know, I've just always naturally been drawn to the arts and sciences. When I went to college, I studied, um, I studied fashion design and accessory design because I thought, you know, I have to, I have to get a job. I can't just collect, I can't just collect roadkill and uh, grow rock candy, you know, from like what chemistry teacher taught me, you know, I can't just do that. Or at least I didn't think I could do that. And so, yeah, and so I studied fashion. So your chemistry teacher helped you clean skulls or taught you to clean skulls. Does that indicate, that indicates to me that you had a curiosity in specifically the macabre a little bit earlier than perhaps what you ended up doing in the interim between then and now, essentially, the fashion design. Were you finding that roadkill, skulls, the macabre, Victoriana were things that were themes that were coming up of interest to you when you were at school? It's, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good question. It's funny because I don't really see them, I don't really see them as very separate things because when I was in fashion and when I worked in it too, I was working mostly in shoes and accessories. And those are also, you know, those are made out of dead animals as well. Like I used a ton of, you know, leather and snake skin and gosh, there were so many, you know, depending on the, depending on the brand I worked at, there are just so many cool and, and beautiful animal products that we worked with. I would say that the sustainability in taxidermy is a bit, is not even a bit better. It's way better because we know where everything, you know, because more things are used and there are less like, you know, less waste is created and there's less byproducts to it. But I think it's always just been, it's always kind of been hand in hand, but they've always, they've always coexisted. And I don't, yeah, I guess I didn't go straight into taxidermy because I just didn't think that there was enough demand for it to live off of it financially to just have like the job stability yeah that's I think that's kind of what what separated the two so when did you finally come to taxidermy you said you were using animal products in your accessory design 
And was this kind of evolving into anthropomorphic accessories? Was there a theme of taxidermy coming up in the accessories that you were helping to create? When did it come to the point where you were like, I'm going to get stuck in with taxidermy now? Um, So I think one of my last projects in school was this jewelry project where I made I made this ring using raccoon vacuum and it was you know I had like inlaid some like rough pearls in there too like it was a really it was like a really cool it was a really you know I think that was like my first cool project with with an animal product and you know that kind of like was bridging the two worlds and doing taxidermy I was doing it as a hobby while I was working in fashion. So I'd say, I would say probably like if we really went into it, like to put a number on it, it would probably be around 10 years ago. Um, if you wanted to count like my hobby time as, as getting into it. So what is it about taxidermy that you feel you really connect to? And we talked very briefly about sustainability and you alluded to the fact that taxidermy, we use a lot more of the, of the parts, but what is it that you feel is your sort of intrinsic pull towards taxidermy as a medium as opposed to like paint and a canvas sure so I love anything sculptural so you know taxidermy is three-dimensional and it's funny because even when I was working in fashion like I loved shoes and accessories because there are they are like sculptures you know they exist they exist in a space and people interact with them and taxidermy is the same way you know it's a sculpture it exists in a space and people people interact with it and the really what really draws me to it is that it's really the perfect combination of, of art and science. And it's also a reflection on, on death and mortality. And there are so many people who are fascinated with animals and, you know, until recently, most of my experience with animals has been through, through taxidermy, through looking at it or, you know, we're now making it, but it's just a way taxidermy is such a great way to get close to animals and, you know, the act of taxidermy itself is so radical in some ways, too. Like you're using your hand to give something a second life. And there's just so much poetry in that. I don't think there's a way to not be attracted to it. <laughs> yeah. And that, using the word poetry, actually, as an isolated word is kind of brings me really nicely to what I wanted to ask. And that's about the kind of ethereal, whimsical quality of your work specifically. I do feel like your work gives off this poetry because you are so conscious of a kind of romantic renaissance to your work. Can I ask where that inspiration is coming from? Is that conscious choice or is just is that just the intrinsic way that you create? Oh, well, thank you so much. That's such a kind of thing to say. Um, that's sort of like, I, I hope it does that. I think the, the inspiration really, honestly, the inspiration really comes from, you know, it comes from the animals themselves. Like animals are just so, so beautiful. It's almost like, I feel like every time I approach an animal, I'm like, gosh, I hope I don't mess this up. You know, I hope like, I hope I do some justice to this, to this creature. And another really big inspiration, I think that is kind of overarching is storytelling. And, you know, across, across time and space, you know, humans have always been these storytellers. And so wanting to tell an insightful story about an animal to not just celebrate its beauty, but to hopefully kind of have someone see something personal in it so that they're also inspired to take some action for conservation or to sort of, you know, to live mindfully and to think of animals when they live and to think of the environment around them when they live. I think that's really, that's really the, that's really what's part of it. And, you know, it's also, it's funny because I've been thinking about like, at first, like when I first started, I was like, oh my gosh, like so many people think my work is too whimsical. It's too playful. It's too this and that. And I was sort of like, you know, sort of went inward a bit and was like, maybe I shouldn't do this kind of work. But then, you know, after really thinking about it, I was like, we kind of just tend to be suspicious for one, whatever reason, we tend to be suspicious of things that kind of suspend reality and kind of dismissive of, of something whimsical as frivolous. But honestly, it's, it can be really powerful because there's an imaginative way of storytelling that's kind of unexpected, but it's approachable. And, you know, and when people feel good, they're probably going to be more likely to have a change of heart and how they act in real life. So I think serving some of this fantasy kind of plants a seed and gets people to think about animals and hopefully conservation in a way that something like totally and purely academic might not be might not condition them to Mm -hmm. yeah and actually you just said something really interesting there you said that you like that taxidermy makes people think about nature as somebody who kind of historically has lived in cities do you think that 
it's more important than ever to make people aware of the environment that they're living in and, you know, bringing nature indoors and getting people to be more grounded by nature and not fixed on technology and things like that. Do you think there's an essence of your environment that you're trying to n- kind of narrate? Is that make- Am I making sense with that question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think so. And I mean, like, you know, in like, luckily, like every city is different. Every area of each city is different too. But I think, you know, the more of us that live in cities, we are disconnected from nature. And so, you know, even things like, even things like the, the house plant, the house plants being a trend, you know, that's just, you know, that's not just from, that's not just from Instagram. It's because plants are, gorgeous and they make us feel good when we look at them and they make like any room is better with a plant in it like there's no way a room is going to be uglier when you put a plant in it so I think nature just you know it it's beautiful we're drawn to it we're just there's no way we can't be drawn to it so I think that yeah I think taxidermy does it does help with that so more specifically about the practice that you make We've talked about, we've used words like whimsical and fantastical, et cetera. But your work has often been categorized as rogue taxidermy. Would you say that that is a fair reflection of your work? And also, would you mind explaining what rogue taxidermy is to listeners that perhaps don't know that phrase, haven't ever heard that before? Sure. Um, So when I started doing taxidermy professionally, you know, because of where I lived and the social circles I was in and all of that, I was definitely exposed to rogue taxidermy and there were so many events for it. And, you know, especially, you know, in New York City, there were all these, you know, there were all these gallery shows and art shows and all of that stuff um, and just, you know, various events. Um, And so that's sort of how I started in it. As far as the work I do now, I don't think it really, I think it's moved on, moved on from that. Um, it's just a different, it's sort of gone in a different direction. Um, but rogue taxidermy for people who don't, who might not know the term, um, there are many different definitions to it, but my personal, like my interpretation of it is, or what I see it as is taxidermy that isn't attempting to recreate the animal as it once was. So anything that is making the animal into something else. And that's, and that's very, you know, that's very open-ended. And it's interesting because a lot of people think that rogue taxidermy is something new, but historically the work has been around for a while. And, you know, a lot of people know of Walter Potter, but even someone like Charles Waterton, who was like this very serious naturalist, um, even on his spare time made some really, he made some really strange looking creatures. Like he made some really weird stuff, which I think is amazing. I think that's like, you know, it kind of it kind of makes me want to read his scientific stuff more because you could see how he had this he had this bizarre sense of humor. But even as far back as like I had I've definitely, you know, had the pleasure of looking at some cool old things. Um, but I was reading this text from the 16th century that was um, it was this anonymous text written by I think written by someone in France. It was like an anonymous author, but it was a book full of tutorials and there were a couple of what I would consider rogue taxidermy tutorials in there because there's a tutorial on, you know, mummifying or like partly mummifying stuffing a rat and sewing, you know, bat wings on it. And, you know, that was, in, and that was in the 16th century. That was, you know, that was before we had any of these, you know, that was before I think we even had the word, you know, a lot of the words we use to describe taxidermy now. So I, I've always just found that part of it so interesting. Absolutely. I mean, it takes me back to what you were saying at the beginning of our conversation about the narrative and the storytelling. And I think, like you say, we have so much literature from history about whimsical creatures, you know, the griffin. And I mean, they're the unicorn, for goodness sake. And they're things that can constantly come up. And so these people had these visions of these animals. And it's amazing because the public perception of those animals is never critical. But I feel like the minute that it transcends into taxidermy, it, it's, it's often met with a little bit of hostility. And I wonder why you think that is. You know, I think it's a lot of, I think it's a lot of discomfort around death. I think that, you know, people don't, like, like in the past, and it's so, it's so hard to just make a big sweeping generalization, but, you know, in the past, most people were a lot closer to death. I mean, relatives lived together in the same home, you know, people lived at home, they died at home, they were, you know, washed and buried and all of this stuff, their last rites were carried out at home. And the more we industrialized, there were a lot of good things about it, because things got a lot cleaner, but we also really distanced ourselves from death. 
you know, even in our food chain, like we don't like when I want some turkey, I go to the store and buy it. I'm not going out to, you know, I'm not going out with, you know, I'm not going out to hunt it because first there's nowhere to hunt it in Brooklyn. And second, you know, we just go to the store now. And so like, there is a bit of, you know, there's so much disconnect. And I think that taxidermy kind of makes people feel uncomfortable. You know, with that, with that death, they kind of immediately go to, oh, someone harmed this animal in order to, you know, in order to make this. But they don't think that about food. <laughs> it's, just, it's strange because it's a presumption about taxidermy that you don't see with like the meat industry. And it's, it's quite amazing yeah. because it's such an immediate visceral response. And I wonder if that's just because people are so, we're so affectionate, we project onto animals when they're alive. Um, whereas a piece yeah. of meat, so abstract, it doesn't look like the animal, whereas we're actually creating a likeness. So there's that emotional, uh, there's probably a psychological term for this, but it kind of registers in your mind as an animal, but yet it's it's rigid and not living. <laughs> it's, so, it's so true. As soon as you put, I think as soon as you put a face on it, because, you know, even from a fashion background, like I collect lots of, you know, I collect vintage clothes. And, you know, back then there would be, you know, those mink stoles with, you know, the two funny little button eyes on them, you know, very, very varying in quality. Some of them look cute. Some of them just look like googly eyes. But, you know, they used to wear those back then. And now we're like, oh, my gosh, that's just so gross. We're, we'll think of it as something I've seen people call it grotesque and this is, these are garments that are, you know, decades old that you, they're just not, um, they're, they're just not made anymore. But even still, even knowing how old it is, people are, people kind of feel bad about it. I think also a lot of it might come from, you know, there's no face on the, the having a face on it. And there's also just like the idea of what conservation is supposed to be. I think people have a very black and white idea that, conservation doesn't involve any kind of death but it does because everything dies somehow or some way and you know humans have altered our environment so much that a lot of the answers to these questions are far more nuanced than than you know than anyone knows because no one has solved no one has solved the problem yet so yeah there's a lot there's a lot to it you you just said there about talking with regards to art as as a science and that's actually a, a phrase that you gave in an interview to Science Line. How do you feel that taxonomy does fit into science? Uh, we both know it as a record of taxonomy and, and the public don't see it that way. Why is it so useful? Why is it so important in keeping a record of our species? I mean, there are so, you know, there are so many reasons. I mean, there are the, there are the upfront reasons like extinction. Um, you know, there's so much data that we have throughout time where how one species can change throughout time. So a specimen mounted, you know, even a specimen mounted in the 40s might look different from a specimen mounted now. And it might look a specimen mounted, you know, 50 years from now. So those are all, you know, those are all like the very valuable reasons to keep specimens around. There's so much, you know, there's so much data to be held in them. And there's so much data that we don't even know about yet. There are questions, you know, one of the most exciting things about science is that there are questions that haven't been answered, but there are also questions that haven't been asked. That's like, you know, just electrifying. <laughs> and, you know, going back to science and art, I feel like there is so much unexplored potential for art and science to collaborate you know, to engage with each other, but also to the public, because really art and science, they're both ways of making sense of what we observe in the world, you know, just interpreting what we see in the world, interpreting different kinds of, you know, interpreting different kinds of observations. You know, taxidermists are very observant, so we have to be because of, you know, because our, our work depends on it. And, you know, art and science, they both ask you know, they both ask questions. And I think there's, you know, there's a really great, there's a, there's a really great beauty in that. And I think there's also a great beauty in sort of letting down those, um, laying down those walls and kind of surrendering, like realizing that we're all just surrendering ourselves to this wonder. And I think taxidermy has such a, it's such a great medium for inspiring that wonder because you can see how magnificent these animals are when you're able to get close to them where, you know, where you normally won't, where you normally wouldn't be. And I think that that personal touch that the art that the arts provides, I mean, I think that taps into that can really tap into humanity in a way that that just science alone might not be able to. 
Yeah, definitely. And I feel like it being animals bridges the gap between science and art because I don't know many people who don't like animals. So it's kind of like this harmonious middle ground. And then you can kind of have the two branches off of just animals generally. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, everyone everyone loves animals. They're they're beautiful. <laughs> they are. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're totally biased though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, Divya, I want to talk to you a little bit about your taxonomy and how it gets seen, who's seeing it, who's buying it. I know that you've done some work for education, so outreach, museums, conservation, but that's also complemented by your kind of artistic narrative fashion side. What are you doing day to day? Who are, you, who are your clients? What are you trying to say with your art? Sure. So, yeah, so it's, it's kind of cool being able to um, you know, being able to work across multiple, across or multiple client bases. So a lot of like a lot of the clients that come see me for home decor, they want something, you know, they want an animal for their home because it's beautiful. They want to enhance their home with, with a beautiful animal. Sometimes there are pieces, you know, sometimes the pieces might take on a symbolic nature if they're sort of a memorial piece, or sometimes they're pieces that, you know, they're, they're like, I love when a client will say like, I want, a pink bird my budget is xyz and you know go here my size limit is this so there's a lot of you know there's sort of a lot of creativity to be had there but as far as the types of clients it really is you know it really is all over I mean sometimes it's sometimes it can be a prop rental or a movie that needs you know that just needs something for for a shot um this year I had, I was able to work with, um, Tiffany and co to make these blue butterflies for them, which was, it was so funny because they kind of, they were like, we need a butterfly that's Tiffany blue. And I was like, I don't know any butterflies that exist that are even close, but I was like, there are these and there are these. And they're like, just make, they're like, just make one. And I was like, oh, it doesn't have to be an actual species that exists. So (laughs) they're like, yeah, yeah, totally. We just want it for the fantasy. We just want a butterfly that looks you know, butterflies that look like they match this. It doesn't have to be real. Like it doesn't have to be a scientifically accurate species. And I was like, oh gosh, okay. So, you know, so there's sort of like all sorts of, yeah, I guess there are all sorts of different, um, there's sort of a different set of challenges and excitement and creativity that comes in with, with like the, the home decor and design, design clients. Mm. And are you doing much work that is more steeped in museum and conservation outreach or is it mostly editorial and high high fashion clients <laughs> it's a bit of both honestly it's great there's there's definitely both which is which is really wonderful yeah. it's a lovely legacy to lead as a taxidermy to know that your work is is kind of spanning all of these different areas but some of it's going to be seen by like the next generation or some of the, whether that's around the dinner table on like a mantelpiece or in a museum it's really it's like such yeah. a clever medium I find it's it's fun it's really fun I think that like there's it's it's so fun <laughs> like there's a real beauty in it and it's also just it's also nice having you know having different types of having different types of projects because I think it would I don't know. I think it would get boring doing only one type of thing. Mm-hmm. Do you do you, you don't specialize in one specific type of animal, birds, mammals, etc. You do a whole array of species. Mostly, I do birds. So I mostly specialize in birds. If I do mammals, they're probably really small. I don't really do anything. I don't really do anything really large. I think probably the largest thing I would take on would be a fawn like a deer fawn but even then it would have to be little um I wouldn't want to do like a a really big one (laughs) is that a space limitation or is that a personal is there a personal reason for that it's personal it's it's a bit of both there's a personal reason because I kind of feel I kind of enjoy working on a smaller scale Mm -hmm. and of course you know that was there's also a space limitation as well but I kind of get my fix of working on the bigger stuff when I go and work with George at his studio that's sort of when I'll like, you know, I'll go see them mounting like all these huge, you know, just like big old deer and bears and all this, you know, and all this other stuff. And it's, it's amazing, but it's also like, I'm like, you know, my, my scale is, my scale is desk sized and smaller. <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> I'm and I've met you and you're very petite so I can't I, I mean not just to underestimate your um strength and power but I, I mean these animals are enormous and they take a whole team of people so I completely understand yeah 
<laughs> yeah, some of these animals are so huge that, like, when you see them, you know, that's another thing that's amazing is, like, you don't even realize, even something like a deer, you know, everyone knows, everyone knows what a deer looks like, right? But you don't really know how big it is until your, your head is right next to it. You know, some of them can, you know, some of them can be huge, some of them can be small, like. So to tell me a little bit about when you visit George and Dante's studio, because people won't know what, what it is that you do there. Are you working for him? Are you just going to get a little bit of experience? What's the deal there? Oh, yeah. So when I go, um, when I go to George's studio, when I go to George Dante's studio, I work with him there on museum taxidermy and historic restoration. Divya, you now live in New York City. What's it like being a taxidermist there? Does the environment that you're in impact you in any way? For example, are you physically limited or perhaps not getting enough green at the window? How do you combat this? Ooh, so I love living in New York City and I love being a tax dermis here. I'm fortunate to have been here for a while and I have a really stable space, but it is definitely smaller than an ideal tax dermy studio. But I think the interesting thing is that in New, like New York, we're always improvising. And, you know, a lot of people like, you know, and like a lot of our friends have always been like, wow, your studio looks so clean and all these photos. And I'm just like, because it's so tiny, if it was dirty, there wouldn't be a photo, I couldn't stick my arm out and take a picture. <laughs> so I think it makes you improvise, but it also kind of that in itself presents its own presents its own creative challenge. And as far as green space, I mean, I'm super fortunate to be within biking distance of a really nice park. You know, it's sort of been like, especially now, it's sort of been a refuge. Well, not now that it's freaking cold out, but when it was nice and warm outside, it was a real refuge because, you know, there were tons of birds there, um, lots of like, lots of birding activity. But even beyond that, New York City is so unique and New Yorkers are just so good at improvising that all these things would pop up there, like outdoor performances and music. I mean, there was even someone doing like a burlesque show in one of the fountains in the park. It was just, it was like fan, pure fantasy, you know, out being served outside. And you kind of see this and you think, you know, people do struggle in this city, but there's also the other side of it where there's this sort of, this sort of just like practical creativity that, you know, that is really everywhere. And the other thing, you know, New Yorkers are so unbothered by anything. So like if you had like, you know, if you had like taxidermy on the subway, like no one's going to say anything because they've seen it. If they've either seen it all before or they just don't care <laughs> or they're just like not my business. Whereas I think in I think in other cities where people kind of, you know, people kind of like make more comments, <laughs> they kind of will, will say like, oh, what is that? I remember driving out of the city. I had I had a piece of taxidermy in the back seat of my rented car, and someone asked me about it. I was like, "Why are you looking in my car? Get away from me!" <laughs> but I think on the other side, though, like you know, space. My space is small. I'm lucky that it's stable, but I do worry a bit about the future of the city because I don't know. You know, this is a this is a truth all around the world, all around cities in the world. But you know, commercial rents are are just so high. I mean, where rents are falling in other cities, they just keep getting higher and higher here. And I worry about how that's going to impact, you know, how it's going to impact like all the working class people, including the artists who, you know, who make what's amazing about the city, you know, all of these, all of these working people are what make the city run. So I do worry about that. And that is a bit of a challenge. Um, when you want to do arts and education work because you know you do need space for it so so that's a bit of a challenge but I'm hopeful. <laughs> I'm moving you on a little bit just to the book that you wrote in 2016. I could give you a whole intro but it's your book so I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you tell it. Could you talk to me a little bit about that project, why you decided to do it and how it came to actually exist as a real product that you can buy on the internet? For sure. So, um, yeah, in 2016, myself and my friend Katie, we co-wrote a book called Stuffed Animals, A Modern Guide to Taxidermy. And um, it came about because, so a publisher had reached out to me and to her, the same publisher. They reached out to me and her separately and asked us both if we wanted to do a book. And being friends, we messaged each other and we're like, did you get this email? Do you think it's real? <laughs> Because the first thing you do when something sounds good, especially in New York, you think, oh, this is a scam. So, 
<laughs> so it wasn't a scam. We, you know, we looked up the person. We we're like, this is definitely not a scam. So we were like, you know, it'd be kind of redundant for us to do two separate, you know, to do two separate books. And, you know, Katie very much specializes in mammals and the larger stuff, whereas I very much specialize in little birds and the smaller stuff. So we thought, wouldn't it just make sense to do one book, one book together? And we suggested to the publisher that we, you know, that we co-write it and collaborate on it. And, you know, we both have very different experiences and different styles that it would be, you know, it'd be really cool to, to do it together. And so we kind of approached it as a, as a beginner's guide and as sort of a guide for people who had never had never had experienced things in taxidermy before or were just curious about, um, you know, just curious about how things are made and just the frequently asked questions that we got is what we wanted to, what we wanted to answer with it. And, you know, it's not, it's funny because looking back on it now, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff I would add and change. But, you know, that's what happens when, you know, that's what happens when you're practicing anything. You kind of like, you kind of are like, oh, but there's so much, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. So it's, it's so interesting in that way. But what's funny is that, you know, when the book came out, we had no idea how it would be received, but, you know, it was received pretty well. And now people are still receiving it well. So we're very, you know, we're very happy about that. And we think, um, you know, we think it's kind of nice for there to be something accessible and something that can kind of just answer, that can kind of just be a starting point so that people can, so that people don't feel overwhelmed because it can be overwhelming trying to, trying to learn taxidermy without, you know, if you're starting from, if you're starting from zero. Yeah, absolutely. And not only have you written that wonderful book, but you also have a lot of resources available on your website and you do a great deal of outreach through your Instagram, whether that's IGTV videos or your own slides, etc. You mentioned the word accessible and I'd love if you could go into a little bit more detail about why you think it's important to make our industry accessible and why you think that it's your responsibility to do that. For sure. I mean, I think, and I think a lot of us, like even you too, Elle, I mean, like you, so many educational resources out there. And I think, I think a lot of our generation of tax terms has this experience that it was not really easy for us to find a place to learn. And it was not very, not very easy, not very comfortable. And granted, you know, like there's always discomfort in learning and, and all of that stuff, but we sort of, it's, it can be so overwhelming to, you know, to go into these, you know, to go into the, these worlds with when you're starting, you know, when you're starting with nothing and, you know, accessibility is important because it's the only way we're going to build bridges. And that's whether that's a building bridges with the public, with institutions or any, or, you know, bring people into this industry. I think that if it's accessible, of course, you're going to have a lot more opportunity to, to welcome people. And, you know, historically, taxidermy has kind of existed in the margins. And, you know, I don't think it's ever going to go as mainstream as like knitting or like, you know, cross stitch or something like that. But I do think that demystifying certain parts of taxidermy can not only enrich our industry, but it can also kind of help others develop like a more informed appreciation for what we do. Mm, definitely. And you did say that you think taxidermy exists within, quote, these these margins. And I'm just wondering why you think that that is. Why do you think taxidermy has historically always been like that? I mean, there are so many, I think there are so many reasons to why, you know, to why our industry kind of lacks, lacks diversity. It's weird. I think like one thing we can look at across the board is the history. You know, there are parts of the history of, of taxidermy and natural history in general that are just very ugly. You know, with people who have been impacted by colonization and other exploits, you know, and we kind of tend to like, you know, we kind of tend to romanticize and look at certain, you know, look at certain events and figures and whatnot without taking this like longer nuanced look. Um, but I also don't think like sweeping something under the rug is the right answer. I think we kind of have to look at history as as its whole. And there's not going to be, you know, there's not going to be one, one clean cut, you know, there's not going to be one clean cut answer. But I do think that when you look at these uglier parts of history, and you think about someone who might descend from people who were negatively impacted by this, or people who are actively currently negatively impacted by some of these things, it's not hard to see why they wouldn't feel comfortable or welcome in these spaces. 
And, you know, I think that along with accessibility, I think having the positive representation and being really intentionally welcoming is so, you know, is so important. Um, the other thing is like historically taxidermy has also been very niche and very guarded as sort of the secretive, the secretive art form. And, you know, it can be, you know, those things are always going to be, it's always going to be harder to kind of come across information in that way. So it's going to take, you know, it's going to take a while of, of, of building bridges with that, you know, and it's, and it's so interesting because like when I look at the events in, you know, the events that I see in New York city or LA or even, you know, even all over, like, I don't know, all of the like more artistically geared events, I see a crowd that looks like the city I'm in. And I would love to see that at the taxidermy specific events, if that makes sense. I want, I just want, I want it to look like, because those are the people who are interested in it. Like everyone's interested in it. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And even in my own experience, having gone to some of the taxidermy specific events, whether that's been the world championships or the European taxidermy championships, there is just not an accurate representation of what society is today. And it's, it's actually obvious now. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're just not, it's just not there. And, you know, I think it's just a multifaceted, I think it's a multifaceted issue to, to address. But you're, you're making incredible strides in changing that and making uh, more accessibility and more diversity. You're running a taxidermy scholarship program specifically for Black, Indigenous, people of colour and LGBTQ plus individuals. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? It sounds really exciting. And anyone who's listening that might be interested. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I would, I would love to talk about that. So again, again, it comes up again, the question of, you know, the, or the topic of accessibility, you know, giving you know, giving people an appreciation for, for what we do, but also making it accessible to them and having themselves, having, seeing themselves doing it. Um, you know, after looking at, you know, after looking at people who come to like my classes and events and not seeing that reflected in the larger, you know, in the larger professional industry, I sort of thought, you know, I should go, like, I want to do, I want to put something out there that will make, that will make taxidermy more accessible. And, you know, before, you know, I'm trying to not talk about the pandemic, but before the pandemic hit, I had a few classes planned with a few groups that directly address a lot of these initiatives and in these communities. Um, but of course, with, you know, with, <laughs> with Miss Corona who came in, <laughs> she said no classes and no travel for you. So, so those classes were all, the, you know, those classes were canceled. And of course, once it's safe to travel again, I want to do them again. But after working from home for, you know, for a few months and talking to these groups, I thought, you know, instead of me just doing it as sort of like a thing I do in my free time, why not turn it into something of a more formal, you know, something of more of a formal initiative and kind of actually fundraise for it as opposed to, as opposed to just doing it, you know, as opposed to just doing it on the side, like make it, make it something official. So I hope to kick off that program once in-person gatherings and travel are safe again. I have been doing virtual events with, with some of these groups, which has been wonderful. Um, but I think it's going to be so exciting to do, to do these in-person classes because they can lead to, you know, they can lead to meeting people in person and, and, you know, seeing work in person, you know, I kind of, I kind of really miss, miss that miss that element of it definitely and I mean I have to commend you Divya because you single-handedly tr blazing an absolute trail and it's an inspiration oh, to everyone you. <laughs> and you know while I have you here I might as well say that you are part of the reason that I have become so in tune and awakened to the lack of diversity in our industry and I, I don't want to keep harking on about it but no, no, I do no. feel as though as ambassadors for our trade no matter how small you are how big your following is it's really important that you are actively taking strides to make real change because it's like I said in the conversation earlier it's got to the point now where it's so obvious and it's uncomfortable so if you're not acknowledging that and you're not making attempts to change it I think that that is is just denying the truth and I don't think that's reasonable well, that's wonderful thank you I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to see that and I think you know I also think too that I think that a lot of it also comes from just like, you know, being in New York City, like there is, you're just exposed to so, you're exposed to so much here that like, you kind of, you, you, I mean, people here, I guess people here are, are seen as, like, I'm not, I, I've, li I've lived in New York for so long. So, but I, like, you know, I still hesitate to call myself a New Yorker, even though I've been here for like almost 20 years. <laughs> but, 
I think people here are seen as like kind of cold, but they're not. They're just really very direct. And so, you know, if I go somewhere and I see something that's just like, huh, that's weird. <laughs> like if I'm in a room and I'm like, gosh, like where, like, why does everyone look the same? Why does everyone have the same background? Like where are, where is everyone from everywhere else? Like there are so many people back home that are so into, you know, that are so into this. Like, why don't they, why aren't they here? Why don't they feel welcome here? Um, so those are sort of like, you know, that's sort of just where, where it comes from and wanting to, wanting to share that. Um, and I think too, that, you know, that I think anyone has the ability to, you know, to do it as well. Like it might be, it might not be, per, you know, nothing's going to be perfect at first. Like I think, uh, there's an event I do, um, I, there's an event I do here that's a showcase and competition that, you know, the first year I was just like, I just need to get, I just need to get this venue booked. <laughs> I just need to get this venue booked. And I was like, I have 20 artists coming or 25 artists coming. I hope no one like, you know, it's a nightlife event. I hope no one like pukes on stage or gets drunk. I hope all my performers show up. I hope the judges are like, you know, I hope the judges are here. Like I paid everybody. So I did my part. <laughs> You know, so I think that like, oh, I think that sometimes people can feel afraid or apprehensive of taking the first step or doing, or you know, of doing something like that. But um, I think that not taking the first step, not, I think it's better to try and make a mistake to learn from it as opposed to not even trying it at all. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I was just going to add off the back of that is, with regards to women in STEM, we're seeing at the moment such incredible advancements across that whole bracket of education and study. But I feel as though taxidermy still hasn't been represented within that bracket. And I, I feel as though now is its time to be seen and to be seized within that, that genre. And I, I feel it absolutely deserves to be there. Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely does. You know, I think women in STEM, it should, you know, does include taxidermy. It should include, it should include taxidermy. And I think that's just going to help. Like, I think getting it, you know, getting more people interested in taxidermy is going to help. I, it's just going to help our industry to have a better reputation. It's going to have you know, how exciting, you know, if taxidermy is all about storytelling, like, how exciting is it going to be to hear the many different stories or to see the many different stories told through it with different people in it? Absolutely, absolutely. And you very early on in our conversation, we're talking about the chemistry behind taxidermy. And I think because it has, so, because it's so multifaceted, I just, I don't think anyone can deny its its position within a science genre. And it's something that I personally find that I'm constantly trying to defend taxidermy as a science and an art. And I don't know if you ever experienced that. Oh my gosh, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's so strange because like, you know, oh, you're going to hear a siren. You can tell I'm really in New York City. <laughs> okay, I'll let it, I'll let it pass. <laughs> yeah, I do feel like, having to, you know, it is a constant thing to defend taxidermy as, as something that is a science that does deserve a place in STEM in, you know, in these institutions, or even just as, you know, or in science, like, I can't tell you how many events I've gone to that are, you know, conservation events, or like, enthusiastic, like, I love birds. So I go to so many bird events. And, you know, when they're like, Oh, why are you here? you're a taxidermist. And it's like, yeah, I love animals. Like I love these birds. And, you know, recently I've been, I found a, you know, that was sort of in the beginning. Now I've like definitely kind of found my people. So I found a lot of, you know, there are groups here that are far more open-minded and welcoming our local, like our local Audubon society, our New York city Audubon is awesome. Um, there are many bird clubs here, like feminist bird club is one to look up, but there are so many there's so many groups here that do think, you know, that do see a legitimate place for taxidermy in it, but there's still so much work to do to like help people realize that it is, that this is something legitimate, especially with our generation of taxidermists. Mm -hmm. And I think also you point and you touched on a really important thing, you know, taxidermists love animals. We wouldn't go through such what, it, what is essentially quite a painstakingly laborious process to create something and make it look like an animal again if we hated animals. I think a lot of people find 
they assume that it's motivated by brutality, that the animal must have been deliberately harmed um, for it to be dead. But I know you're very conscious about sustainable sourcing. Where are you getting your animals from? So the animals I use, since I mostly work with birds, I get a lot of, and in the U.S., our, our bird laws are a bit more, I think they're a bit more restrictive here than you have over there. Um, you guys get so many cool birds over there, but we use, um, I mainly get birds from aviaries or zoos or private, you know, or farms or people who raise them. Um, the starlings and sparrows, the English, English sparrows and European starlings are considered invasive here. So those I get, um, if I, sometimes I can pick them up as, as roadkill if I see them. Most of them I get from abatement projects where on migratory paths, they do a humane call of the invasive species to, you know, to clear them out so that the native birds can have nesting grounds. Um, so it's most of the specimens I get are, you know, are from, from either of those. Um, any of the mammals I get, like the squirrels and things like that, a lot of those are from, a lot of those are either roadkill or just from other taxidermists. And I know a lot of taxidermy is connected to hunting and there's sort of like another smaller divide I've seen where a lot of the more like old school taxidermists kind of think like the newer generation is opposed to hunting. But I think a lot of us are not really opposed to it when it's when it's done mindfully because there's so many there's so many conservation based traditions. There are so many indigenous traditions with hunting that are very, very sustainable but I don't think I have many hunting clients because they're not like they're not hunting the things that I like to mount. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 totally. Absolutely. And I suppose a lot of taxidermists who are OK with any hunting endeavors there, like you say, there has to be a conservational basis or a kind of a conservation objective. It's not like they're going out and doing it for the fun of it. There is definitely an ulterior intention that's actually going to protect the longevity of the species. So it's not about today or tomorrow. It's about the future of our species, which is obviously a much wider lens and a much more, you know, long-term goal. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, again, I think that it's also how nuanced a lot of these situations are that, you know, when I, when I first learned about hunting, it was through, you know, it was through watching cartoons and cartoons show us that a hunter is like, (laughs) that a hunter is someone like, Elmer Fudd, you know, this like bumbling guy that just wants to kill Bugs Bunny. And you, you know, you, you definitely take a side with Bugs Bunny because, you know, he's cool. He's just eating carrots. He's mischievous. <laughs> so I think that, you know, with, when you're informed by that and you grow up and you're like, oh yeah, hunter equals, hunter equals the same thing as poacher. It's not true. It's not, that's definitely not the case. Um, you talked very briefly about that you love birding and you found a community of people. You mentioned the Audubon Society. How important is it to you, do you think, that you are looking at live referencing of birds, you're looking at live animals to inform your practice? Oh, it's so important to look at live animals um, to inform this practice because, you know, they're the inspiration. They're the reason why, I think they're the reason why we do any of this. You know, if if I woke up tomorrow and somehow the laws of the world and the universe changed and there was no such thing as death anymore and everything was immortal, then I would take up like cross stitch or, or, you know, or something else I would do like painting. Then that's when I would go on to, or making sculptures or something like that. Um, And I think, yeah, the live, the live animal observation is, is important because it kind of keeps you focused on, on what you're doing this for, whether it's technically being focused by, you know, making observations that will inform, you know, that will inform the work to be better, or if it's just remembering um, and recentering yourself and your intentions to, you know, to preserving nature as opposed to to worrying about much else. Divya, do you think that your thoughts on mortality or death have changed at all through working with mortality on like a daily daily basis and having that kind of constant reminder do you feel any different having started with taxidermy I think I've become a lot more sensitive to death and mortality when working with taxidermy because you know you see it you see it every day if it's a skinning day you see it if it's a flushing day you see it you know and I think that you realize how precious life is. It's definitely a misconception that people feel um, 
a few people feel that taxidermists aren't aren't sensitive to it or I think you know I think even having sometimes like there's just you know sometimes it'll just be like gosh there's a big glob of fat like you're looking at it you know on your on your flushing desk or whatever and you know if you make a joke about that glob of fat I think people kind of translate that into oh you don't take death seriously it's um it's really the opposite it's just sort of you know, it's just sort of when you see something every day, like you kind of, you kind of navigate it. Um, you, you'll navigate it differently as opposed to, to someone who doesn't, who doesn't see it at all. Yeah. And I suppose that's the science behind it. That's the fact of the matter. And I, I do think from where I stand, you, you do approach it with sensitivity, but also you approach it with, you're, you're an educator. And I think a lot of the times when you would point out that glove of fat, you're actually doing it not in a kind of have has a jokey way you're trying to inform and I think that's something that you do so effortlessly is have the the kind of harmonious sensitivity but also with the like the education oh thank you I, I sure hope so <laughs> <laughs> Divya I'd love to talk to you very briefly about uh competing and associations because a lot of people when I tell them that we have these an incredible competitions um and state competitions and whatnot they don't really get it they don't believe it you know people outside of our industry they're like what you have a world championships for taxonomists what's going on (laughs) and can you talk to me about your roles um I know you sit on the board for two taxonomy associations but also you've competed and you've won awards talk to me a little bit about competing generally sure I would love I would love to talk about that um well competing it's so funny because again like coming from coming from the fashion industry competition is is so much different in taxidermy because the judgments are actually constructive <laughs> and not like you know they're based in something like judgment of artwork is always going to have us have objective and subjective sides to it but with taxidermy we're talking about animals so animals look you know animals are supposed to look a certain way um And so that there's, there's that aspect, but the judgments and stuff are, I think the associations I'm part of, they're really, they're really nice people. They're really kind and they're always constructive and helpful. And I think that's the most surprising part about competitions. When I've taken students from my classes with me to, to the New England or New Jersey shows, they're always so surprised at how, at how informative the whole weekend is. They're always just like, wow, I just feel like I learned so much and they're so inspired and want to go home and make some stuff. Um, But they're also so amazed at how someone with 40 years of experience will talk to someone with like four months of experience. um, And, you know, and that everyone is just mingling in this way that, that really doesn't exist in a lot of other industries. Like, Gosh, when I, you know, when I had a senior position in fashion, like the, my boss above me would tell me not to talk to, you know, not to talk to my assistants. And I'm like, I have to talk to my assistants or else they're not going to do the job. Like, And we are going to have lunch together because it's a human being. Like, this isn't, you know, but those divides, not to say that they don't exist at all because, but they, because they exist everywhere, but those divides kind of exist less in, you know, they exist a lot less in taxidermy. Do, do you remember the first time you, you placed do you remember how it felt yeah it was really cool I was like so I was so excited because I mean who doesn't like validation right like validation Mm -hmm. feels good um you know and especially coming from like the alternative kind of background and kind of the you know kind of like a different sort of like having gotten into taxidermy from you know from like the more rogue side and then being able to you know being able to get some validation from from the you know, from the professional industry, it was, you know, it felt, it felt really cool. <laughs> and it also made me sort of want to get better and do better as well. <laughs> what was the piece that you won with? The very first one, I think was a pigeon at the New Jersey show. It was, um, and it's so funny, because I was like, I'm going to keep this forever. And I was like, eh, I think I'm going to sell it. I think I'm actually going to sell it at the next, um, at the next, like, virtual market or something I do I'm like I'm so sick of looking at it it's in a closet I'm like this is dumb this is ugly I'm so tired of it because you kind of like look at that piece and you enjoy it for a moment and then you move on from it yeah it was a vision (laughs) you do have a fair bit of taxidermy is it all your own taxidermy that you have or do you collect taxidermy from other people because I know you have quite a strong aesthetic going on in your home (laughs) I do I have a lot of antique and vintage taxidermy not not probably not as much as I don't have as much as most people I know like a lot of my friends have a lot more 
and I think like being friends with like serious collectors I I forget that I'm like oh yeah I don't have I'm like oh I have like this and this I don't have I don't have a ton I don't feel like I live in a museum but um yeah there, I kind of like buy pieces that I feel just like an emotional an emotional connection to and most of the time they're most of the time they're they're little birds um I do keep some of my pieces but not not a ton of them I think I keep the pieces I worked hardest on or the pieces that I'm like I, I that I learned something from and kind of keep them around as, as yeah, lessons. definitely they're definitely grounding especially when it's been a project that you've overcome something kind of on a personal level as a creative person, especially because we work on our own. I mean, I presume you are working quite isolated. Obviously, we're in the pandemic, so the world is on pause. But <laughs> you're working on your own, right? You, do you have a home studio? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like when I'm working on stuff from, yeah, when, when I'm, if I'm not working at George's, I'm working alone. So I think that, yeah, I think that a lot of these pieces have, you know, they have a lot more tied up in them sometimes as far as lessons and experiences. Divya, what have you not yet achieved that you'd still like to? Do you have any huge goals of things that you'd like to do in the future? Well, I have. I have set some goals for this year. So we'll see how they happen. We'll see how they go. But I kind of want to take a turn, just like generally, I kind of want to take a turn. Like I love, like I'm still amazed that like having a small business in this city and especially like at this time, like I'm, I'm amazed that, I'm able to do this and it's not, you know, it's not in a bubble, like having supportive clients, having, you know, having steady work, having, you know, having any of this is, it's, it's, it's really cool. And I'm very grateful for it. I really want to kind of take a turn to taking in a few less commissions and working more on, on art projects. Cause as a taxidermist, you know, every year for my birthday or for Christmas, I get some, you know, I get a shipment of, of fancy little birds or fancy big birds or just, you know, fancy, pretty feathered things that I'm like, I want to work on this. This is going to be for me. And they just sit there in the freezer, (laughs) you know, it's the free time working for yourself. I'm like, I can't, you know, working for myself, I have to think of paying bills before I think of making art. So I do want to kind of just take a turn to making, to doing more doing more art projects that some will sell, some will be, you know, for me or for a display. Um, I want to do that. And the other thing I want to do that's a little more, a little more immediate and a little more tangible is I'm planning to start a YouTube channel this year with tutorials and history. So kind of something, just, just kind of something that makes taxidermy, makes taxidermy fun um, and accessible to more people. Oh yeah, that would be awesome. I'll be subscribed and I'll be watching all of them. (laughs) Awesome. <laughs> I think because our medium is also so visual I think people need to see it for us to sow the seed in people's minds you know if you've never come across text I mean you've never seen it you've ever thought about it you don't know anything about it and someone shows you a beautiful image that's you know, well curated on Instagram, talking about taxonomy with such passion and fervor on a YouTube channel and it sows the seed of somebody saying, hang on a minute, this is something that I could either be interested in to actually collect or actually get stuck in and to learn and do myself. So I think the more content that's out there, it's only going to help our business grow. I I completely agree. I think that, yeah, I think when people see it and they see it in a way that's unexpected, and I feel like you probably get this a lot too, but there are so many people that I meet clients that I have that have said to me, I never even thought of having taxidermy in my home before. I didn't even know it was possible for taxidermy to, to exist in this way. And that's like the biggest, I think that's the biggest compliment because you're, you're reaching someone who, who wasn't reached before. And um, um, what about plans with further outreach and conservation? You're, like I say, you're an incredible ambassador for a whole host of different industries not just taxidermy but women in STEM and so many diverse audiences you're helping to increase diversity and accessibility and what do you have planned there and what does your future for taxidermy look like how do you want to see it so I really am like I am so excited to just continue the work I'm doing like finding different groups that you know finding different groups to host classes with 
um, to also when, you know, when in-person events are safe mm-hmm. again, I'm so excited to really kick off this, kick off the scholarship and kind of make it something, kind of make it something that other people can replicate too, so that, you know, if someone is, if someone is not in New York City, but they're in another city, I'd love it if they were like, hey, I want to do the same thing and I'm going to work with this group in my area and, you know, we're just going to, you know, we're just going to do this here. I think that um, that would be the best thing because making sort of an example that others can, making an example of a model or a a sort of a, a, a framework to use that other people can, you know, that other people can use in their own area. I think that, I think that is the best thing because, you know, it can't all be done by one person. And that's the wonderful, that's the wonderful thing about the internet is that you meet other people who are, who are willing to do this stuff. I also really want to develop the showcase I do every year. I really want to, I'm really excited to see, to see where that goes with, with doing more of this outreach, seeing more people come in, seeing more artists show their, you know, seeing more artists show their stuff. Um, that's really exciting. <laughs> well, you're making amazing space for other people, and I, I, I <laughs> admire your work. And I'm I can't wait to see your YouTube channel and all the things that you have planned for this year and all the years going forward. And I can't wait till I can see you again in person. I know. <laughs> I'm so thank you so much. I'm like yeah, I'm definitely excited to see you in person. I'll pro- I'll be in touch with you more formally about about the YouTube stuff because I do want to do some. I do want to make it so that we have like taxidermy and coffee or taxidermy and tea mm. like you know I kind of think it'd be fun to of course like bring other artists on there I think that would be the so fabulous but yeah <laughs> well Divya thank you so much for being on my podcast it's been an absolute pleasure to have you but thank you so much for having me Al it was nice to talk to you So there you have it, my episode with Divya. Thank you to Divya for giving up her time to speak with me. I loved our conversation and I'm totally enamored by not only the work that she's doing with her taxidermy, but also all the activism and continued outreach that she's doing to increase diversity in the industry. If you'd like to get in touch with Divya, have a look at her work, or you're interested in any of the resources that she's mentioned, you can find her on Instagram. Her handle is at Gotham underscore taxidermy. She also has a link tree where you'll find direct links to all of the resources that she mentioned. I'll pop that in the show notes. There's always further reading as well. And her Wunderkammer showcase is there and a lot of other fantastic resources. I'm on the socials in all of the usual places. It's at LK on Instagram and Specimens Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you again for listening and I'll see you next time for episode 11.